Hey guys, Dr. Price with Action Potential Mentoring, and we are going to start off endocrine part two, talking about Crohn's disease. So you need to know that Crohn's disease puts you at a high risk for having a vitamin D deficiency. So it's malabsorptive, right? And so you want to look for Crohn's patients with bone pain. And so there's a huge, huge thing to know here, and I want to spend a little bit of time talking about it. Typically, these patients will get pseudofractures. And so bilateral pseudofractures that are symmetric, meaning in the same areas on both limbs, these are called looser fractures or looser zones. And they're actually named after a physician named Dr. Looser. And so these are a characteristic finding of osteomalacia. Remember, you get osteomalacia from your vitamin D deficiency. So if you have bilateral pseudofractures that are symmetric, in a patient with history of abdominal pain and bloody bowel movements and stuff like that that can clue you into Crohn's, you should really be thinking that these patients have osteomalacia from malabsorption, from the vitamin D deficiency, causing the bone pain, causing the pseudofractures, and that's called a looser zone fracture. These patients will have muscle cramps and a waddling gait if it's very severe. They get those bilateral hip fractures, and you can get thinning of the cortex with low bone density. And you need to know that osteomalacia is associated with malabsorption, aka Crohn's disease, is one disease that can cause it. You can get it with intestinal bypass surgery, celiac sprue, and chronic liver and kidney disease as well. So those are four or five of the biggest clues to help you kind of think about osteomalacia due to malabsorption. If you see any of these other disorders, have that on your differential. Next, let's talk about treatment for congenital hypothyroidism. The initial dose is gonna be 10 micrograms per kilogram of levothyroxine. A uh, high yield point that I wanted to mention from this question was that Wernig-Hoffman syndrome has degeneration of the anterior motor horn, but also cranial nerve motor nuclei. So a lot of people remember the anterior motor horn, but don't forget that the cranial nerve motor nuclei can also have degeneration with Wernig-Hoffman syndrome. On the other hand, myotonic congenital myopathy presents as muscle wasting in the distal extremities, myotonia, testicular atrophy, and baldness. A lot of people get very, very confused when they see the testicular atrophy and baldness in a muscle wasting disorder, but you need to have myotonic congenital myopathy at the very top of your differential. And all states at this point do routine screening for hypothyroidism, PKU, and galactosemia at birth. Those are three high yield conditions to know that all states will do screening for. And so in a patient, in a question stem that says that they had routine prenatal screening, routine postnatal screening, routine birth screening, all these types of things that makes it sound like they've had good follow-up, you can basically cross off hypothyroidism, PKU, and galactosemia off your differential if they've had all of those screenings because they would have already caught that at birth. And so that's kind of just a little test taking clue to help you. By no means is that gonna be right every single time, but for the USMLE, I would 100% stick by that. Next, let's talk about medullary thyroid carcinoma. Remember, you see this in your men syndromes, men 2A and men 2B. And so you wanna evaluate your metanephrins for a pheochromocytoma. Men 2A also can present with parathyroid hyperplasia whereas men 2B will present with mucosal neuromas and a marfanoid habitus. Men 2A and 2B both will have medullary thyroid carcinoma and pheos. So that's huge clues. If you see those two things together, you basically know it's a men 2A or men 2B syndrome. Remember, a pheochromocytoma can cause a hypertensive crisis during surgical procedures. This is easy to forget. So if a patient gets massively hypertensive, anytime that they undergo a stressful event like a surgical procedure, you should really think to look up a CAT scan to see if they have a pheochromocytoma. If found, a pheo should be resected prior to a thyroidectomy or whatever other surgery that you want to do because it can cause those really horrible hypertensive crises during the times of stress of surgery. All right, next let's talk about painless or silent thyroiditis you need to know that these patients will oftentimes have a positive TPO antibody, just like Hashimoto's. Completely did not know that at this time in the question stem. So a positive TPO antibody is not definitive for Hashimoto's. You can also see it with the painless, silent thyroiditis. These patients will generally have a spontaneous recovery. The big clue for subacute thyroiditis, remember, is a painful goiter after an upper respiratory tract infection, and they'll generally have a fever. Hypothyroidism can be associated with hypercholesterolemia, which makes sense. These patients are going to be more overweight. They're going to have higher cholesterol levels, but it also can be associated with hyponatremia. 
so very low sodium levels. So sometimes in the hospital, you'll see some of the internists actually get a TSH level as part of the workup for hyponatremia, and this is why. And last point here I wanna mention is that postpartum thyroiditis is similar to painless thyroiditis, but the latter cannot be diagnosed within a year of childbirth. So both are variants of Hashimoto's and may have an elevated anti-TPO antibody, but patients will generally return to a euthyroid state after several months. So that's why they have the positive TPO antibody. I didn't know that whenever I had this question, and so that's why I wrote this note for you guys. All right, next question. The scenario was a girl with clearly excessive androgen levels. The next best step was to get a bone age scan. So I thought the next best step would be a pelvic ultrasound, but you wanna check the bone age first. So keep in mind that precocious puberty is definitive before age eight for girls and before age nine for boys. The initial evaluation will include doing a bone age eval. So anytime you see that, you're thinking precocious puberty, you wanna make sure that there's a bone age eval. Next, let's talk about DKA and HHS management once again, because it's so high yield. You wanna do high flow normal saline. You wanna add D5 when the glucose is below 200. And the recommendation is IV insulin, but you can switch to sub-Q insulin once their glucose is well-managed, so it's less than 200. They're able to tolerate PO intake. Their anion gap is less than 12, and their bicarb has normalized. It's greater than 15. And you want to overlap the sub-Q and IV insulin dosing by one to two hours. Remember, if their potassium is less than 5.2, you add IV potassium. If their potassium is less than 3.3, you want to hold the insulin at this point. Remember, these patients are going to be severely depleted total body stores of potassium. If their pH is less than 6.9 or the bicarb is less than 5, you want to add bicarb. And consider phosphate if their phos level is less than 1 or they have cardiac depression or respiratory depression. After the intravascular volume is restored or there's a serum sodium level that's normal or actually even elevated, the IV fluid can be changed to half normal saline, but normal saline is always used initially regardless of sodium levels for the first one to two hours. So those are some clues and some tips to help you with DK and HHS management. It's tested so much, that's why I keep repeating this. All right, a couple of high yields about Addison's. Addison's is associated with hyperkalemia. 90% of the patients with Addison's will also have hyponatremia. And if you look at the chloride level, it will be elevated. So look for high potassium, high chloride, and low sodium for Addison's disease. All right, and so to diagnose, you want to get an ACTH level, a serum cortisol level, and to do an ACTH stimulation test to help diagnose Addison's. All right, so this question was, I thought it was really tricky, but it ended up being easier than I thought. So the patient was taking high-dose prednisone for 12 months, but stopped taking it seven days prior and the patient has adrenal suppression. So there is low ACTH and low cortisol. He had no fever, no severe hypotension or anything. So it's really not an adrenal crisis. It's really just adrenal suppression. So keep that in mind anytime you see somebody that stops taking their steroids that they've been on for a long time. All right, rickets. What are some of the buzzwords to know? The big one is craniotabes. And so they'll have a ping pong ball skull the skull bones will basically depress with pressure. So if you can basically push in the skull bones with your fingers, it's gonna be a huge clue for rickets. All right, let's talk about HHS. This is again, hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar, non-ketotic syndrome. These patients have a really high risk of altered mental status, and that's from the high osmolality. So their sodium will usually be super low on labs because of the pseudohyponatremia that they get from their glucose being sky high. So don't be fooled by the low sodium levels because it's actually just gonna appear low. It's a pseudo hyponatremia from the super high glucose. All right, next is premature adrenarche. These patients will have normal bone age. So remember, anytime that you have precocious puberty, you wanna get a bone age scan, but premature adrenarche will have normal bone age and it's because DHEA sulfate does not affect skeletal growth very much. So normal bone age, have premature adrenarche still on your differential. Don't cross it off. Next, this is kind of a good family medicine question. Anytime you have patients with hypertension, you should screen them for diabetes. That's kind of just a overall general health recommendation that I made note of here. Okay, next, potassium iodide. It can be used in preparation for thyroidectomy in patients with Graves or during thyroid storm. 
Steroids are used for thyroid storm or type 2 amiodarone induced thyroid toxicosis and severe subacute thyroiditis that's refractory to NSAIDs. So just know these couple facts here, they're all just high yield one liners. I'll go through them one more time. When would you use potassium iodide? Well, you would use it to prepare for a thyroidectomy in a patient with Graves or during thyroid storm. And then when do you use steroids with patients with thyroid disorder? Well, you can use it for a th thyroid storm, type 2 amiodarone induced thyroid toxicosis, and severe subacute thyroiditis that's refractory to NSAIDs. All right, next, let's do a quick question about Addison's. So a patient with Addison's should get an 8 a.m. serum cortisol level and a plasma ACTH on their initial eval, don't forget. Next, you want to do a cosyntropin stimulation test to confirm your results. I got confused with the diagnostic testings for Cushing's versus Addison's. I don't know what I was thinking, but for Addison's, just know, get an 8 a.m. serum cortisol and a plasma ACTH as soon as you see them. Then you want to do a cosyntropin stimulation test to confirm your findings. All right, and next session, we will pick up with painless thyroiditis.